this, this is really great conference. Um, it's very important that we have public meetings. And it's, it's fantastic that the, the Tennessee uh, authorities here are protecting us from, from the violence that would happen. And I've been at conferences where we have been under assault and uh, a lot of it has gone underground. But this is exactly what we should be doing as much as we can. It's a great conference. I hope we do it again in the future. Uh, quite, a people, uh, quite a few people know me for but the, the, um, the, the books I've written on, on, on Jewish issues. But I also write about who we are as Europeans. Uh, today I want to talk about a very pernicious strand of European uh, uh, culture that is an important for, uh, component, really, of the crisis that we face today. The Puritan strand of, of American culture, which not really dominated America from its origins until about 1960, uh, the, uh, until the countercultural revolution. This is from a book I hope to publish this year. The culture of the West is, is complicated, I think more so than any other culture area that we know of. It's a blend of really very different cultural influences. A basic idea is that Western societies are relatively individualistic, far more individualistic than any other culture area of the world. But within that general framework of individualism, there are important differences. One important strand comes from the Indo-European culture, uh, which started with the Pontic Steps about 4,500 years ago. Um, in the Ukraine, this culture was very aristocratic, it was hierarchical, it was based on military ability, it was, it was a warrior culture, it was a completely militarized culture. Um, the, uh, the, 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 the person who was in charge would, would attract followers and uh, his, his entire, uh, the, the only way he could do that is by his military reputation, it was all about rep reputation. So it was like a free market, as it were, in military ability. So you would att attract followers and you would become a leader and they would go out and conquer people. And they were extremely successful. They went down to India and across the Middle East uh, and up into Europe. Uh, a very successful culture. Um, but interestingly, the, the barriers between cultures did not last long in Europe. Now, in, in, in a place like India, they did, where they had the caste society. But in, in Europe, uh, they, over time, the barriers between this Indo-European elite and the people they conquered gradually disappeared, as you would expect in a more individualistic society, that we're, we're, we're fairly closely related anyway. Um, this continued really among the Germanic peoples that, that uh, dominated Western Europe after the fall of the Roman Empire. Indeed, the Indo-European model uh, dominated European politics uh, from prehistory to the 17th century in England. The watershed in, in, event in England was the English Civil War, the 1640s, pitting Cromwell and the Puritans against the crown. The radicalism of the Puritan Revolution was that ultimately led to the, to, to the destruction of the Indo-European model of society. This revolution was far more radical than, than, the, than the revolution whereby Christianity destroyed the pagan gods of old Europe. The old order, this new order was far more egalitarian than the older order. Congregations uh, chose their own ministers and they served at the pleasure of the people they served. The Puritans, of course, came to America, settled first in New England. But they had very high fertility and gradually spread across the continent to the west coast. Uh, really, they, the entire northern tier of states. Abraham Lincoln, for example, was a Puritan stock originally. They tended to be middle class tradesmen, intact families, few servants, no slaves, relatively educated, and they greatly valued educate, education. It's, it's interesting that within just a very few years of landing at Plymouth Rock, they established Harvard. You know, and then they established Yale and all these elite Ivy League universities. Education was very important to them. I mean, it was an acquisitive society, capitalist society. Uh, it was materialistic also. <clears throat> the culture of the South, on the other hand, was a variant of the Indo-European culture. <clears throat> it was derived mainly from distressed cavaliers who were on the losing side of the Civil War, uh, of the, on the English Civil War. And it was culture based on a sort of natural hierarchy, but they perceived a natural hierarchy rather than egalitarianism. And of course, it involved the slavery of Africans. These two fundamentally different social systems were at odds really from the beginning of American culture, of American history. The, the fundamental break, of course, was the Civil War, the consequence of which was the victory of the, of the Puritan conception of society. 
As Professor Andrew Fraser said in his book, The Wasp Question, which I think is a very good book, The Wasp Question, Arthos Press, as a consequence of the Civil War, the absolute hegemony of the, of the, of the uh, egalitarian, acquisitive, and utilitarian society pioneered by the, by the Puritan Revolution was firmly entrenched. This Puritan, this Puritan tradition gave rise in the 19th century to a, a uh, liberal intellectual tradition, which was derived from the Ivy League universities of New England, particularly Harvard. Within their base of the uh, Ivy League universities, Puritan descended intellectuals dominated intellectual discourse in the United States really until the rise of a Jewish elite beginning in the 1920s and increased their power through the 1940s and 50s and really came to dominance in the 1960s with the countercultural revolution. <clears throat> the, the, uh, the, 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 the uh, main intellectuals of this Puritan of the Puritan tradition opposed slavery. They advocated on behalf of the lower classes and immigrants. They cr created what we would consider now to be a culture of the left, utopian, idealistic, moralistic. Many of them were, were Unitarian clergymen or Congregationalists. Those were the two main uh, Protestant denominations that they were in. They can be grouped as advocating uh, what came to be called transcendentalism in philosophy. You may have heard the term as a school of philosophy in the 19th century. It was essentially coming from these people. The most famous transcendentalist was Ralph, Ralph Waldo Emerson. Without going into details, transcendentalism was egalitarian in the important sense that they saw everyone as possessing a, mark, a spark of divinity. A Christian idea that goes back to the ancient world and was a defining uh, belief of the Quakers, who were actually more egalitarian than the Puritans. The, the Quakers were less influential in this country, but they were actually more influential in, in England in, in ending slavery. The, the, the main impetus in, in, in Britain for ending slavery at the turn of the, 18th, of the 19th century was, were the Quakers. They financed it and at, were active in so, the whole thing. But in America, it was mainly the Puritans. Uh, and this was uh, the idea that, uh, that, that universal divine inspiration, grace is the birthright of all, was the bedrock of this transcendentalist movement. You can see it's really a sort of a religious movement uh, at heart. They believe that ideas of God, morality, and immortality are part of human nature. They do not have to be learned. This is a spiritual equivalent of a democratic ideal that all men and women are created equal. <clears throat> The truth of these egalitarian beliefs was seen as obvious. It wasn't a matter of empirical demonstration. <clears throat> it was uh, seen as compellingly obviously true. You didn't have to prove it scientifically. One might say, therefore, it really was a sort of religion. Not surprisingly, this, this philosophy led many transcendentalists to become deeply involved in social activism on behalf of the lower echelons of society. The poor, the prisoners, the insane, the development, uh, the disabled, and most critically, of course, the slaves in the South. In the United States, the main energy for the anti-slavery movement came from these Puritan descended intellectuals. And of course, this long presided any Jewish influence. As I said, Jewish influence doesn't really get to be important in American history until the 1920s with Boas and so on, but really coming to, the, to be dominant in the 1960s. I'll, I'll give a brief sketch of some of these intellectuals. Uh, a, a man named Brownson uh, lived, uh, his dates were like 1803 to 1876. He admired this, this Unitarian uh, belief in the inherent dignity of all peoples, the promise of eventual universal salvation for all believers. He believed in the unity of races, the inherent dignity of each person, and he lambasted Southerners for trying to enlarge their political base. Like many New Englanders, he was outraged by the Supreme Court decision in the Dred Scott case that required authorities in the North to return fugitive slaves to the South, to the owners in the South. For Brownson, the Civil War was a moral crusade, waged not only to preserve the Union, but to emancipate the slaves. Writing in 1840, Brownson claimed that he would, that we should, quote, realize in our social arrangements and the actual condition of all men uh, that equality of man and man that God had established, but which had been destroyed by capitalism. It was kind of ironic because uh, the Puritans were very good at capitalism, really, an awful lot of uh, the, the, the uh, as 
Professor uh, Fraser said, I mean, uh, the, the, the Puritans established an acquisitive, materialistic society, but at the same time you had this idealism, this utopianism at, at, at the, among this intellectual elite. According to Brownson, the Christians had to, quote, bring down the high and bring up the low, to break the fetters of the bound and set the captive free, to destroy all oppression, establish the reign of justice, which is the reign of equality between man and man, to introduce new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness, wherein all shall be brothers, loving one another, and no one possessing what another lacketh. So again, this is moralistic, this is idealistic, this is utopian, this is the Puritan way of thinking. <clears throat> you can also see this with George Ripley. Uh, he was quite famous because he started Brook Farm, which is one of these utopian communities. He, he's, he's born in 1802, died in 1880. Uh, he preached uh, in, in earnest Unitarian central message, a belief in a universal internal religious principle that validated faith and united all men. He founded Brook Farm on the principle of substituting, quote, brotherly co cooperation for selfish competition. He questioned the economic and moral basis of capitalism, held that if people did the work they desired and for which they had talent and held uh, the, the result would be a non-competitive class of society which would achieve personal fulfillment. Needless to say, this utopian experiment died uh, about, after about five years or so in debt and in poverty. But it was a defining characteristic of, of these intellectuals to reject the idea that human of, of a human nature in favor of an idealistic, utopian causes always framed in moral terms. This sort of thinking, of course, has not died with them. We still see that very commonly now. It's rampant among those who promote the end of white majority. America in, in favor of multiculturalism and demographic transformation as a result of immigration. People who say that white people, the people who built the country, uh, that they want to retain power, they're racist, they're white supremacists. We have, uh, you know, diversity is our greatest strength and all that. Those are meant to be moral. They're meant to be idealistic. They're, they're meant to really be utopian, and, and they don't care. They, they sort of like the idea of utopian ideas like that. Theodore Parker is another one, um, 1810 to 1860. He was a Unitarian minister, writer, public intellectual, model for religiously motivated uh, uh, activism. He, he wrote that God is alive and in every person. God is not what we are, but what we need to make our lives whole. And one way to realize that is through selfless devotion to God's creation. Parker was concerned about crime and poverty. He was de deeply concerned about the Mexican War uh, and opposed to slavery. He blamed the social conditions for, for crime and poverty, environmentalist, uh, obviously. <clears throat> he condemned merchants. We are all brothers, American and foreigners, put here in the name of God for the same end, journeying towards the same goal. Parker's view of slavery was the blight of the nation was the real reason for the Mexican War, because it was aimed at expanding the slave states. Parker was far more socially active than Emerson, becoming one of the most prominent abolitionists, a secret financial supporter of John Brown, the guy who, who uh, had a, uh, this ill-fated slave rebellion in 1859. John Brown, by the way, was from New England and of Puritan stock. When, when Parker looked back on the history of the Puritans, he saw them as standing for moral principles. He approved of a Puritan preacher named John Eliot, in particular because he preached to the Indians and attempted to convert them to Christianity. Nevertheless, it's interesting that Parker was sort of a, mysterious because despite being a prominent abolitionist and favoring racial integration of schools and churches, he asserted that Anglo-Saxons were, were the most progressive race above all others. He was also prone to making condescending and disparaging remarks about the potential of Africans for progress. And this illustrates, I think, really an important component of these 19th century intellectuals. A lot of them felt that, that their, the, their, their moralism and everything else was sort of a racial feature. Uh, and they believed also that, that eventually they were sort of superior, but that everyone else would become like them in the long run. Catholics would convert to Protestantism. Blacks would gradually, you know, become just like them, like Anglo-Saxons. They would be, uh, you, you wouldn't even see a trace of them. They would gradually, you know, mate together, and in the long run, we'd all be good Anglo-Saxon uh, Protestants in the end. <clears throat> 
just like them. It's sort of egotistical. They want, you know, the ideal person is me, you know, and if everybody could just be like me, then the world would be wonderful. Um, that, that was really how they, they, they thought. Another one was um, uh, uh, William Henry Channing, died in 1884. He was a transcendentalist writer, a Christian socialist. Christian love and labor and spirit would, would initiate a more egalitarian society. The immigrants, the poor, the slaves, the prisoners, and so on. He worked tirelessly, tirelessly for the cause of emancipation, the Freedmen's Bureau, which was designed to provide social services for slaves. <clears throat> the um, transcendentalists in general were outraged, as I said before, by the, by the uh, Dred Scott decision, which mandated returning slaves. Um, Ralph Waldo Emerson, who, as I said, was the most famous transcendentalist, probably, he said that the, the, the very landscape seemed robbed of its beauty and even had trouble breathing because of the sense of infamy in the air. It's the sense of moral outrage that they had about slavery and about the Dred Scott decision. After the John, John Brown uh, d debacle, uh, Emerson was glad to see that the terror of disunion and anarchy is disappearing. Because he was saying, you know, when, when, when the John Brown Rebellion happened, it sort of made people think, well, you know, this could happen. We really could have a war here. And these people wanted a war because they wanted to end slavery so badly. <clears throat> Both Emerson and Thoreau commented on Brown's New England Puritan heritage. Emerson lobbied Lincoln on slavery. And when Lincoln emancipated the slaves, he said, our hearts are healed. The health of the nation is repaired. He thought the war, the war was worth fighting because of it. 700,000 dead. It's instructive to review these 19th century intellectuals because we see that sort of idealism today among many white people. It's a problem that we have to be aware of. But it's good, the good news is that after the Civil War, the idealism of the transcendentalists lost its preeminence. American intellectuals gradually in place embraced Darwinism. Instead, these previous people had embraced Lamarck. Lamarck had the idea that you could inherit uh, acquired characteristics, that the environment that your parents were in would affect the way their children were, and so on. Darwin didn't believe that. It was mainly it was genetics, really, that would determine what you were like. Um, change is possible. In other words, these pure intellectuals, uh, by the turn of the century, around you know 1900. By then, they had really turned their back on this idealism, this moralism. Um, Transcendentalism was a distant memory. These, these new materialists had won the day. Change is possible. In the case of the United States, as it entered the 20th century, there was increased concerns about the massive immigration. They could realize that these people were not assimilating. They were not becoming just like them. They were radically different from them. <clears throat> There was increased concerns about massive immigration, especially the immigration of Eastern European Jews, who tended to be political radicals, and also quite a few of them were Orthodox Jews. They looked different, and they had these very radical political ideas. These immigrants and their descendants, of course, then became the backbone of the American left, beginning early in the 20th century. The early part of the 20th century was a high watermark of Darwinism in the social sciences. It was common at the time to think that there were important differences between races in both intelligence and moral character. Not only did the races differ, they were in competition with each other for supremacy. For example, William Graham Sumner was a social Darwinist. He thought that social class and racial divisions as well as competition were part of the natural order of things. Writing in 1903, he noted that, quote, the two races live more independently of each other now than they did during the slave era. Whereas early in the century, Jewish intellectuals led the battle against Darwinism, I, sh I should say, whereas later in the century, Jewish intellectuals led the battle against Darwinism in the social sciences, which I've written about in my book, The Culture of Critique. Racialist ideas really became part of the furniture of all intellectuals during this sh relatively short period. It's commonplace among intellectuals of all stripes, including a significant number of Jewish, of Jewish racial Zionists who believe really in, in Jewish racial superiority on the basis of, of sort of Darwinian ideas. The victory of Darwinism, however, was short-lived. <clears throat> however, as the left became reinvigorated by the rise of several predominantly Jewish intellectual and political movements. <clears throat> 
Marxism, Boazian anthropology, psychoanalysis, the Frankfurt School, and other ideologies that collectively have dominated intellectual discourse ever since. However, the interesting thing is that the intellectual milieu shifted in response to these external events, resulting in a period of ethnic defense between about 1880 and really until 1965, until that immigration law was changed. My suggestion is that we're going through a similar period now, with many intellectuals and well-educated people coming to realize, white people, coming to realize that the regime of immigration multiculturalism is a disaster for white America. Toward the end of the 19th century, as American, American intellectuals were coming to grips with this large-scale immigration from Eastern and Southern Europe, the optimistic views of the transcendentalists were more and more difficult to defend. A large number of immigrants were seen correctly as, as politically radical and unassimilable. Optimistic, liberal views on immigration persisted among a small group of intellectuals, but they were politically powerless. Among the many pro-restrictionist intellectuals, Darwinism had won the day. The result was a very effective alliance between, between the intellectuals of Ivy League educated, Puritan descended uh, extraction with rural whites in the South and the West in an effort to prevent being overwhelmed by this threat. As Eric Kaufman noted in his book, The Rise and Fall of Anglo-America, whenever the Northeastern WASP elite makes common cause with a less prestigious but more numerous provincial kin, Anglo-Protestant ethnic nationalism revives. Maybe that will happen now. This alliance, which essentially lasted until the passage of the 1965 immigration law, which opened immigration to all the peoples of the world, <coughs> indicates that despite these liberal strands of WASP culture, change may occur if liberal cosmopolitan views are seen as being disastrous. If the 19th century optimism of immigrants being just like us has proven obviously unwarranted. Similarly, in the present era, American whites are coalescing in the Republican Party, not on the traditional basis of social class, because we see a lot of white working class people now voting Republican, but as a result now, of a common racial identity. And among them, there's increasing skepticism about the benefits of immigration. Even before the 1920s, Jewish organizations were the main force against continued immigration, managing to, to delay immigration restriction until the 1920s, 30 years after. Think of that, 30 years after popular opinion turned against it in the United States. They kept the doors open. Largely as a result of this activism, and despite the fact that even though immigration restriction was universally accepted by 1890, an effective immigration restrictive bill did not happen until 1924. 20, during this time, two million uh, Jews uh, came in, 20 million other uh, total immigrants, um, and of course, among the Jews, they, they very much tended towards political radicalism, as I said. Beginning around 1900, racial theories based on Darwinism held the academic high ground with figures like Madison Grant, Lothrop Stoddard, Henry Pratt Fairchild, William Ripley, Gustav Laban, Charles Davenport, William McDougall. The result was a widespread belief among American, American elites, including prominent military officers, that racial identity was important, that racial homogeneity was absolutely critical, the sine qua non of every stable nation state. It was common to believe that the racial group was uniquely talented and possessed of a high moral sense. But more importantly, whatever the talents and vulnerabilities of their race, they held it in the highest importance to retain control over the land their ancestors had conquered and inherited as a result of the, of the exploits of their ancestors. And despite the power that their race held at present, there was a dark foreboding about the future. You can see in the titles of some of the books of the period, Madison grants the passing of the great race. Stoddard's The Rising Tide of Color Against White World Supremacy, and The Revolt Against Civilization, The Menace of the Underman. They could see that things were turning against them. And this was, you know, in, 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 say, 1910, 1920, this is when whites really ran the entire world. Blue bloods like Henry Cabot Lodge and Madison Grant, who descended from Puritans, were extolling the virtues of Northern Europeans and funding movements to end immigration. The battle that ended with the ethnically defensive immigration law of 1924 
which was based on ethnic status quo's of 1890. A. Lawrence Lowell, president of Harvard, was vice president of the Immigration Restriction League. He was a descendant of Puritans. He opposed the nomination of Louis Brandeis to the Supreme Court because Brandeis was such an ardent Zionist. He supported quotas on Jewish uh, students, 15%, which is rather generous considering that Jews were only 4 or 5% of the population at the time. He supported racial segregation. He opposed homosexuality. Times had changed. The prominence of, of these Darwinian theories of race was not confined to the United States, of course. In Europe, you had people like Benjamin Israeli, of course, was Jewish, um, Arthur de, Go de Gobineau, Houston Stewart Chamberlain, Gustav Le Bon, and so on. And again, a large number of Jewish racial theorists who were entirely on board with this, thinking of their own race uh, and the, the interests of, of Jews in that, in that way. The defeat of Darwinism was a major thrust of Jewish intellectual and political movements, particularly Boazian anthropology. Historian George Stocking uh, said, the, the defeat of the, the, of the Darwinians had not happened without considerable exhortation of, quote, every mother's son standing for the right, nor had it been accomplished without some rather strong pressure applied to staunch friends and weaker brethren, often by the sheer force of Boaz's personality. It was not a scientific revolution. It was a revolution of pressuring of, an, of a new ideology that was explicitly directed against the dominance in the, of, of, of Europeans. By 1915, the Boazins controlled the American Anthropological Association, held a two-thirds majority in the executive board. By 1926, every major department of anthropology in the United States was held by Boaz's pupils, the majority of whom were Jewish. <clears throat> As historian John Hyam noted, by the time of the final victory in 1965, which removed national origins or racial ancestry from immigration policy and opened up immigration to all human groups, the Boazian perspective of cultural determinism and antibiologism had become standard academic wisdom. The result was that it, quote, became intellectually fashionable to discount the very existence of persistent race differences, persistent ethnic differences. The only, the only react, this whole reaction derived, deprived popular race feelings of a powerful ideological weapon. You have to realize that the United States is a sort of a top-down society. The academic world is very important for this. Uh, and so when you, if you can dominate Harvard, if you can dominate the departments of social sciences, this is a major source of power because it filters down. These people are then quoted in the media, which of course also has a large Jewish ownership and, and uh, you know, is, is producers of culture. Um, so it's a top-down process. Controlling the academic world is very important for this process. We can laugh at it now because some of the academic world has become so corrupted with really crazy leftism in departments like gender studies and so on. But uh, it is a very important thing to, to uh, control, and that's really what Boas set out to do. Again, by 1915, you con controlled all the departments of anthropology in the United States by the mid-20s. That is a major accomplishment. And then, and then 40 years later, it had implications for immigration policy. These people testified in Congress. And you had people like Margaret Mead saying, there's no such thing as racist. Ashley Montague uh, saying, you know, we're all equal, all the same, all cultures are the same, we're all divisive. It shouldn't matter who comes here. You know, it's racist to, they used the word racist at that time, uh, to uh, oppose immigration of other peoples. The demise of Darwinism had major implications because it removed the only intellectually viable source of opposition to cosmopolitan ideology and a cultural pluralist model of America. In the absence of an intellectually respectable defense, ethnic defense was left to conservative religion and popular attitudes of the less educated, but they were no match for the cosmopolitan intellectuals that came to dominate the university world. The rise to preeminence of what is now what is now a Jewish-dominated intellectual scene sealed the fate of the Puritan descent intellectuals reviewed here. This Puritan descent intellectual tradition was victorious against the aristocratic tradition of the Old South, but it proved no match for the rising Jewish intellectual elite. 
which by the 1960s had become dominant in critical sectors of American life, particularly the media, the social sciences, the legal profession, financial contributors to political parties. High on the agenda, this new elite was replacement level immigration, which in 1965 was opened up to all the peoples of the world. <clears throat> and often there's, a, there's a, a, a grudge on the part of these Jewish intellectuals about the 1924, specifically about the 1924 immigration law. If you ask any educated Jew, and most of them are educated, they, they understand that. They learn about it in their synagogues and in their Jewish education. They learn about it from their parents. The 1924 immigration law is seen as anti-Semitic, that it was directed against Jews, and in a real, very real sense it was because that was the real concern with the Jewish radicals that came in with these people. They had become radical in Europe. When they came here, they were still radical. They were the backbone of the left that ultimately transformed the country. So to conclude, um, the, 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 a very interesting uh, feature of Puritanism is the tendency to pursue utopian causes framed as moral issues. Their susceptibility to utopian appeals to a higher law is a belief that the principal purpose of government is moral. New England was the most fertile ground for the perfectibility of man creed, the father of a dozen isms. There was a tendency to paint the political alternatives as starkly, co starkly contrasting moral alternatives, with one side portrayed as evil incarnate, inspired by the devil. <clears throat> Puritan moral intensity can also be seen in their profound personal piety, their intensity of commitment, to be seen uh, to, to live not only a holy life, but also a sober and industrious life. The, again, these people were intelligent, they were smart, they were well-educated, and they, that's why they dominated, really. Whereas in the Puritan settlements of Massachusetts in the 17th century, this moral fervor was directed at keeping fellow Puritans in line. In the 19th century, it was directed at the entire country. The moral fervor that had inspired Puritan preachers and magistrates to rigidly enforce laws on fornication, adultery, sleeping in church, and so on, was universalized and aimed at correcting the perceived ills of society and capitalism and slavery. Puritans waged holy war on behalf of moral righteousness, even against their own cousins. Whatever the political and economic complexities that led to the Civil War, there was a Yankee moral condemnation of slavery that inspired and justified the massive carnage of closely related Anglo-Americans on behalf of slaves from Africa. Militarily, the war with the Confederacy was the greatest sacrifice in lives and property ever made by Americans. Puritan moral fervor and punitiveness is also evident in the call of Congregationalist Minister Henry Ward Beecher, Old Plymouth Church during World War II for exterminating, exterminating the German people. The sterilization of 10 million German soldiers, the segregation of the women. With the rise, and, and you know, think about it, the Germans are pretty closely related to the English. I mean, you look at a, a genetic diagram, and they're, they're, they're cousins. With the rise of the Jewish intellectual and political movements described in the culture of critique, the descendants of the Puritans readily enjoyed, joined this moral condemnation of America. You think all the, all the movements I discuss in my book, Culture Critique, really are moral condemnations. They could see, in a sense, they could see what the weak link was that white people in America are really resonate, they really resonate to morally framed arguments. <clears throat> the lesson here is that in large part the problem confronting whites in the contemporary United States stems from the psychology of moralistic self-punishment, exemplified as extreme by Puritans and their intellectual descendants, but also apparent in a great many other whites. Once Europeans were convinced that their own people were morally bankrupt, any and all means of punishment should be used against their own people, just as they did in the Civil War. Rather than see other Europeans as part of an encompassing ethnic and moral community, tribal community, fellow Europeans came to be seen as morally blameworthy, an appropriate target of punishment. The best strategy for destroying Europeans, therefore, is to uh, convince the Europeans of their own moral bankruptcy. A major theme, really, of the culture of critique is that this is exactly what Jewish intellectual movements have done. They presented Judaism as morally superior to European civilization, and European, European civilization itself is morally bankrupt and the proper target of punishment. <clears throat>
The Puritan legacy in American culture is indeed pernicious because once the Puritan descendant intellectual elite had been eradicated, their moral idealism was vulnerable to intellectual and political movements that eventually aimed at replacing the traditional people of the United States. The intellectual and political left, which is the product really of the post-1965 countercultural revolution, had been fundamentally based on a moral critique of traditional American society. <clears throat> relegate them to, uh, which will eventually relegate Europeans to a relatively powerless demographic minority. At this time, any group identification of whites has been pathologized, morally out of bounds. A legacy most at all of the Frankfurt School, which has become a linchpin of the intellectual basis of the new elite. As someone with considerable experience in the academic world, I can remember feeling like a wayward heretic back in 17th century Massachusetts, when confronted, as I often was, by the academic thought police. It's a moral favor, fervor of these people that stands out. The academic world has become a Puritan congregation of stifling thought control, enforced moral condemnations that a, a 17th century Puritan could scarcely surpass. In my experience, the thought control is far worse in Ivy League universities founded by Puritans than elsewhere in academia. A fitting reminder of the continuing influence of Puritanism in American life. Given the state of affairs, what sorts of therapy might one suggest? To an evolutionary psychologist, this moralistic aggression seems obviously adapted for maintaining boundaries and policing the behavior of closely knit groups. The psychology of moralistic aggression against deviating Jews, often called self-hating Jews, has doubtless served Jews well over the centuries. Similarly, groups of Puritans in Massachusetts and their descendants doubtless benefited from moralistic aggression because of its effectiveness in enforcing group norms and punishing cheaters and defectors, thereby creating effective groups. Puritans, by the way, did start out as a closed strategy. They didn't want anyone else in Massachusetts if a Quaker wandered up to Massachusetts, uh, they would string them up. I mean, they, they were really, really tough. They didn't want anybody else there. Massachusetts was for Puritans only. But the British government then prevented them from carrying through on that. They, they, they forced them, this is the colonial period, they, they forced them to admit other peoples. And so Boston, Massachusetts couldn't remain a Puritan group strategy, you might say. A proper Darwinian sense of moralistic aggression would be directed at those of all ethnic backgrounds who, are, who have engineered or are maintaining the cultural controls that are pr presently dispossessing whites of their historic homelands. The moral basis is quite clear. There are indeed genetic basis differences between peoples. Therefore, people have, very, have conflicts of interest based on their genetic differences. This is Frank Salter's view, very important book. Um, the, um, his book's called On, On Genetic Interest. Very important book, we should all read that. <clears throat> Ethnocentrism has deep psychological roots, causes to feel greater attraction and trust for those who are similar to us. That's the work of J. Philippe Rushton, who's also done work on, on race differences. As Frank Salter notes, ethnically homogeneous societies bound by ties of kinship and culture are more open to re re redistributive processes like social welfare, health care, and other public goods because you're giving them to people like yourself. You're not giving them to people who don't look like you. It's, it's it, cross-culturally, uh, ethnically homogeneous societies are much more likely to do that. That's why Sweden and all those European societies that did the extensive health care did it when they were still ethnically homogeneous. I don't think they do it now. I think homogeneity is associated with greater social trust, political participation, and ethnic homogeneity may be a precondition of political systems characterized by democracy and the rule of law. Uh, I am very concerned that you know, when, when whites become a minority, you can forget about the Constitution, you can forget about the rule of law, you can forget about anything that this country was founded on. These things are uh, they're human created and they can be undone and they will be undone. They can be done undone gradually as sort of done in the Supreme Court or they can be done you know, just uh, by popular demand uh, when, when whites become a minority. The problem with the transcendentalists and the other 19th century idealists and moral perfectionists is that they came along before their intuitions could be examined in the cold light of modern evolutionary science. 
Lacking any firm foundation in science, they embrace the moral universalism that is proving to be ultimately ruinous to people like themselves. And because of the voluntary loss of demographic and cultural hegemony being experienced by European-derived populations so contrary to human-evolved predispositions, their moral universalism needs constant buttressing by the power of the state. Much like the rigorous rules of the Puritans of the old require constant surveillance by the authorities. Indeed, as a universalistic, anti-white left assumes greater and greater control, we see censorship of heterodox thought at universities and the proliferation of police state measures to ensure conformity of thought and deed, highly reminiscent of Puritan Massachusetts. In the UK, where the Puritans originated, people are being arrested for Facebook and Twitter posts critical of migration and multiculturalism. The main difference between the Puritan New Jerusalem, and the Puritans did think of themselves as Jews in a way. They, they thought of, of their uh, utopian ideal society as the New Jerusalem. They were going to build this New Jerusalem. They, they saw themselves almost as a 13th tribe of the Jews or something. <clears throat> um, Unlike Puritan, this Puritan New Jerusalem, this multicultural New Jerusalem would not be controlled by people like themselves, who in the long run will be a tiny, relatively powerless minority. I doubt their descendants will appreciate the moral fervor of their ancestors in destroying white America if they are forced to live in such a society. Three take-home messages. The first is that intellectuals can change. We saw that uh, during the 19th century you had this very strong liberal strand um, uh, utopian, idealistic, moralistic, but it did change and, and Darwinism became uh, dominant uh, in the early 20th century uh, and they did believe that race was important, race differences were important and the whole thing. Secondly, white people are prone to moralistic outrage. We have to convince them that what is happening to us is immoral outrage. Yeah. Right. <clears throat> They, and I would say that morally outraged white people are a formidable force. So we can get them on our side that to have the moral fervor of their ancestors, but against this multicultural insanity, we would really have something. Uh, you know, I, I, I think that uh, I don't think we can motivate white people unless we frame it in moral terms. We can't simply say, well, it's good for white people or something. That's not going to work. What we have to talk about is it's immoral to be taking away, to be subjecting ourselves to, to this uh, you know, onslaught where we're taking in these people, we're supporting so many of them, the rising in crime and the whole thing. Uh, just a disaster. <clears throat> Third, even though the forces of immigration restriction won the day in 1924, in a very real sense it was too little too late. The Marxist inspired radicals of the day became the parents of the red diaper babies in the 1940s. They were then the backbone of the left that was triumphant in the 1960s, as discussed in my book, The Culture of Critique. This fundamentally Jewish group became an integral component of the intellectual, media, and political establishment of the US. They were instrumental in the Immigration Act of 1965, which opened up immigration to all the peoples of the world. Immediately after the bill was enacted, the activists pushed for greater numbers to the point that we now have over well over a million a year. This has transformed the political landscape with Democrats being the party of non-whites. Rather than the class-based politics I grew up with, voting Republican uh, meant you were sort of in the business class, more educated and so on. Uh, it's not that way anymore, it's race-based. Uh, everything has become racialized. We're subjected to endless messages promoting white guilt for the past, the suffering of non-whites who nevertheless continue to do whatever they can to get here. And there are ever-increasing attempts to remove basic freedoms like freedom of speech and gun rights. The UK is already a police state of the left. We are heading in that direction, perhaps only a couple elections away. Political attitudes are more polarized now than any time since the Civil War. In 1924, Americans restricted immigration to conform to the ethnic status quo of 1890. What they really needed to do was to deport the newcomers in droves. We are seeing the same situation now. Even if non-white immigration were to stop tomorrow, the changes wrought by past immigration would continue apace. 
births of non-whites are approximately equal now to, to the births of whites. As Virginia was saying earlier today, they're going to outstrip us demographically in the very near future. You're going to come a point very quickly where non-whites are the majority of children born in this country. One wonders if American whites have the political courage to do what needs to be done, repatriation, or at least carve out an ethno state in the U.S. There's an old Chinese proverb that goes, may you live in interesting times. That certainly applies to us. It's a curse. We live in interesting times. Thank you.